Raja Loka Dipati Sahampati Katan Jalian Diwarang Hayacata Sandi Dasata Paraja Kajatika Ese tu dama anuka pimampaca. Namo tassa pakawato arhato sama santu tassa. Namo tassa pakawato arhato sama santu tassa. Namo tassa pakawato arhato sama santu tassa. Utang damang sangkang namasami. Pita, my sound is still okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening and good morning and good afternoon, whatever time zone you're in. Nice to be with you. I'm here with uh, Venerable Amrishir and Venerable Vipassi in the uh, Bhikkhu Library at Tisarana. I was uh, contemplating who might be listening to this uh, talk, and usually if I, if I give a talk, I kind of know the people there, and I know how much experience they have. So I'm not quite sure how much experience different people have in this audience. So let me say that I assume you all have a working knowledge of Theravada Buddhism and its concepts. If you don't have that, you might not be able to follow what I'm saying. So it's good to get a good intellectual grounding in, in Buddhism, and this school specifically is Theravada Buddhism. So I assume you know that. Uh, secondly, I assume that you are committed to the five precepts, committed to uh, a life of virtue and a life of moral integrity, and also, I assume you're committed to a lifestyle of generosity and compassion. Um, those are the kind of basics that, not just basics, fundamentals and, and, and uh, essentials of, of the spiritual life. And so I think you are all on board for that and you, you practice that. So I, I, won't, I won't go to those issues too much because I think, I think for the most part, the people I meet who do retreat, they have a a really strong commitment to ethics, they're very good people. Um, so let me not address that, but keep that in mind, that that's a, the assumption that I would make. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd like to just consider confidence and, and doubt as uh, aspects of mind and aspects of the path. And um, we'll see where it goes. I'm not quite sure what I'll say around that, but uh, you, you'll have your own reflections and thoughts. And these kinds of talks, they're not, they're not sort of um, dogmas of belief and, and one way to look at things, just my particular reflection on, on these kind of very important ideas of confidence and doubt in this case. We were trying to set up the Skype meeting be beforehand, and apparently my, my internet connection is very poor. I'm having a lot of thunderstorms right now. It's very hot. I think it's 27 degrees outside. So I'm using the phone, and that took us about 10 minutes to figure out. So there was doubt and uncertainty. And that's natural, isn't it? Doubt and uncertainty. And so we, we worked with it, and we're all pretty intelligent people, and voila, we have a solution. So doubt is important. It's not wrong. It's a very, very a good thing. If we didn't have doubt, we wouldn't have problem solving. So problem solving involves doubt, and then our intelligence is engaged by the problem, and, and we gain a solution. And there's something quite lovely about that, being able to have the intelligence and skill to take on a problem and solve it. It's quite reassuring. I think it, it uh, builds a good character uh, if it's used rightly. And like, so for instance, I've been I've been uh, doing woodwork and trying to build furniture the last three years, and, and every year I get a little bit better, and each time I feel a bit more confidence with the machinery and so on. But if I look at uh, a Japanese carpenter who's been making furniture 
in his family for 10 generations, I realized that my competence is, is very, very low in comparison. But that's okay. It's not, a, it's not an egotistical thing, but the, the confidence I feel, it's a tactile thing. It's, I've learned, I've tried, I've, I've, I've failed and I've succeeded, I've failed and I've succeeded, I've failed and succeeded. And, and that kind of confidence we all have to make a meal for uh, 20 people, a 10 course meal for 20 people at a family gathering, that takes a lot of confidence to put that together. It's a lot of work to, to close a difficult business deal, to um, uh, be in a courtroom and, and uh, deal with very abstruse legal issues and be able to navigate that and so on and so forth. So we all have a, a certain amount of confidence and competence uh, in the world. And those are important. I think they're very important for a sense of self-worth uh, and also being able to put food on the table, pay your mortgage, these very, very practical things. If we don't have that, then we, we're just struggling to survive in the world. So there's that kind of confidence. Other kinds of confidence can come from, say, a teacher. Uh, when, I, when I went to Thailand, <clears throat> and I, I was, you know, I was, a, uh, I was 23, and I, was, I had some determination to do this, but I had no real idea of Buddhism. I had my own, you know, adolescent and young man confusions and views and opinions and so on, and I had never meditated. So I wasn't very confident. I was determined, but I wasn't very, very confident. I had a lot of uh, self-doubt and things like that. But my teacher, Ajahn Chah, and latterly Ajahn Sumedho, um, they had a lot of confidence, and they had a lot of integrity, and their being was very uh, inspiring uh, in the way they presented themselves. And so if they said, hang in there, keep at it, you'll, you'll be better, don't worry about it, keep going, keep going, that gave me confidence. That gave me confidence to keep going. Now, that's, that's, uh, that could be problematic if I had faith in someone who was a charlatan, or who was taking advantage of me, then of course that faith would be misguided and I could be hurt. So one has to be um, fairly circumspect about the teacher one confides in or one takes refuge with, right? But that's a kind of important confidence, and, and that kind of confidence is also, our, I think, our kalyanamitta, our friendships. When we have friends who, who love the Dhamma, who live more lives, who uh, understand mindfulness and the practice that we can turn to them or with our problems and they give us the confidence to keep going. That's, that's very, Kalyanam is very, very important. So I think of my own life. If I hadn't had Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Sumedho and my friends here at Tisarana, I don't know what I would have done. I mean, I would have tried to be a good person, but the, the, the integrity of a group of people supporting you is, is, is so very, very helpful. So even though you might have self-doubt or doubt about the path, you have someone else who has confidence and who has integrity and says, no, keep going, this is the direction. So Kalyana Mitta are, are, are very, very important. Another way people get confidence is through opinions. And uh, this, is, this is a tricky area because people will have strong, people who are maybe um, very opinionated will have a strong opinion and it won't be just truth it'll be their opinion is right, and it'll be a kind of dominant force. And you can be very intimidated at people who are very, very opinionated, right? Especially if you don't have an opinion. Uh, I know I've had that in situations where I have no opinion, and then I come into a situation and if someone has a strong opinion, and then I feel, oh, maybe I should have an opinion. <laughs> I don't have an opinion about that, but maybe I should have. So I feel intimidated, maybe. But the trouble with people who are very strong in that way, they're not necessarily wise. They're not necessarily wise, but they can be very, very strong and forceful. So nowadays, we have all these um, conspiracy theories, right? Um, people are very adamant about uh, the Twin Towers or how Kennedy died or all the others. I don't follow them because I think it's... Anyway, <laughs> that's my opinion. I think crazy. <laughs> but... But that can be, you know, you can get drawn into a whole bunch of opinions and ideas, but you don't really know. You don't really, really know. So there's, there's ways of confidence which are, which are uh, I would say, dangerous or confusing. And, and views and opinions are very much that way. 
it's not wrong to have views and opinions, but to attach to views and opinions um, limits you by those views and opinions because usually they're invested in a sense of ego. My opinion is right, your opinion is wrong, and, and hence all the struggle we have in the world from the attachment to views and opinions. So that's, that's a quite a big issue. But what, what, would, what would confidence in, in, in Dharma look like? What, 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 what would, you know, in, 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 in the classical text we have doubt kind of talked about in two ways. Doubt as a hindrance to meditation, the Nivarana, and then doubt as one of the three fetters which prevents entry into the stream of Dharma. So, so doubt is natural, right? So we had doubt about the technology involved with this. We, we figured it out. So uncertainty is natural. So when the third fetter says that you are beyond doubt uh, in the teachings of the, of the Lord Buddha, what, what, what would that mean? Well, it wouldn't mean that you never had doubt, would it? Because then you'd never have a mind which could solve problems. It couldn't be that. You have no doubt about the teachings of the Buddha, the, the three refuges, the Buddha Dharma. What might that mean? Well, one of the kind of paradoxical ways you might look at that is to th when you have self-doubt, when you don't feel confident, maybe when things aren't going well, uh, or maybe you said something which you have doubt about, maybe you shouldn't have said that, or someone uh, has said something to you and you have doubt or you have doubt in your relationship or whatever, and self-doubt comes up. Now, self-doubt is different than technological doubt. Technological doubt is about technology and the problems that you have to deal with. Well, self-doubt is about a sense of me, a sense of ego, a sense of me as a person living in this world. Now, if a person is living immorally and not practicing generosity, then a lot of remorse and self-doubt will come up, undoubtedly. So always a recommendation, live a good life. Do good, refrain from doing harm. But even putting that in place, self-doubt can be very, very insidious. It can really come into your mind. Uh, am I worthy? Am I up to it? Uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should have done something else. So what would, what would um, confidence be in the realm of those kinds of feelings and thoughts? Well, if you said to yourself, I shouldn't have any self-doubts at all, then what do you do when they come up? You can't really deal with it. But what is, what is confidence in Dharma? Well, confidence in Dharma is the mind which can step back and can say, I know that I know. I know that I know and I'm feeling self-doubt. If I can step back and know self-doubt as an object, say, I know that I know, then that's a confidence. And there's a confidence that this self-doubt is an object. It's a thought. It's an emotion conditioned by what's just happened. It's a habit of mind. I know it as a formation in nature. So even though, and this is the paradox, even though in the midst of self-doubt, that mood might be there, behind it is awareness of change. And that awareness of change is where you find your confidence, not in a mood. If you think that going beyond doubt is that you always feel confident, you'll be in trouble. You'll be in real trouble, right? Um, and not just because of technological problems. Let's say, like, I'm 73, and my memory is, is getting rusty or non-existent sometimes. <laughs> so my memory doesn't work well. I mean, it works, you know, I still know, I still know I'm here, dumb and so on. Uh, but as I age, you know, there are other things will happen. My, my physical abilities will lessen. I won't be able to do this and that. And I'll probably feel very vulnerable as I get older. And that vulnerability might be not just physical, but also psychological. Maybe even though I've been a monk for so long, I'll feel, oh, well, maybe I'm not doing something right or whatever. But is that really a problem? Is that a problem? No, no, not if I understand what confidence is. And confidence is knowing, wow, this is a feeling of vulnerability. This is a feeling of self-doubt. I know that I know. And then, and then what happens is it does not populate my consciousness. It does not create a sense of self, which then goes on and on and on for days and days and days. Why? Because I've known it as Dharma. And that's, that's what we mean by Dharma. 
by Dharma we mean we know the nature of reality objectively rather than be the subject. So there's a difference between, as I ever last week I was saying, there's a difference between kind of thinking self-doubt thoughts, oh, am I good enough, or I'm not getting anywhere, or this isn't going to work, or whatever, and kind of knowing I have self-doubt and saying to myself, oh, self-doubt feels this way. That's awareness, awareness of change. Now, what's, again, a, a kind of another paradox around this is that if you think about Ajahn Chah's teachings, right, what did Ajahn Chah teach? He said, I mean, he taught many things, but one of his constant themes was uncertainty. Now, you think about it, he was, he, was develop, he was encouraging us to actually contemplate uncertainty and have confidence in that. That's very paradoxical, huh? don't you think? Now, how am I going to get confidence by looking at uncertainty? But if you do that, if you try that, and you just have an opinion, or you have a bodily feeling, or the weather is a certain way, and you say it's uncertain, what does that do? It takes you back to knowing that you know. You know that you know, and this moment is uncertain. And that kind of confidence does not depend on the object. And that's why that constant refrain of anicca, or uncertainty, leads to the unconditioned, leads to nibbana, inclines towards the deathless, inclines towards peace, because it's not about the condition. Whereas craving, wanting, Wanting certainty, wanting, wanting um, uh, security. These are good things. Security is a good thing, yeah. But now, let's say you have, you know, we have the COVID thing and massive unemployment in North America and uh, whatever. It's, it's, it's very, very uncertain, right? And so that uncertainty is going to tr trigger in you uh, a, lot of, a lot of thought. And some of that thought is important. You have to think about okay, what's plan B? Or what's plan C? Or what's plan D? You're going to have to think about that. And to somehow, unless you come here and ordain as a monk, but we don't have that much space. <laughs> and so that's limited, right? That's, but, so there is planning, and there is contingency planning, and that's very, very important. That's problem solving. But because it is uncertain, the mood of doubt, the mood of uncertainty would be very unpleasant. Now, the craving mind, the craving mind, it wants certainty. And that's what leads to worry. There's a huge difference between worry and, 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 and strategic planning or good foresight, right? There's a huge difference. Now, worry is an emotional thing based on fear, driven by ego, driven by a sense of self. Now, you, can, you, can, you will feel that, right? You will feel that. There's nothing wrong with feeling it. But if you understand that feeling coming up and you say, this feeling is uncertain, I know that I know this will change, <coughs> then you begin to have confidence within uncertainty. See what I mean? Now, that mood might come up a lot, especially if your job is very threatened or <coughs> there's some illness in the family or whatever, sure. It might be very strong. That's why practice requires this kind of consistency and courage and, and just trust, trust that you know that you know. So the, the excuse me, I've got a, I was in the workshop again. <laughs> got to do something about that work. Bit of a call. Um, so now the thing about moods is they don't like, once you notice a mood come up, doesn't mean it ends there. It ceases for a moment, yeah? And it comes up again. Why? Because that's the power of habit. And habit is karma, yeah? So the work of, of, of freedom, the work of freedom is to return to know that you know. And that's where the confidence is. That's the confidence in Dharma rather than the belief in self-thinking. You, you take worry, say. Worry is a belief in self-thinking. What happens if this, and what happens if that, if this, if that, if that, and the mind just spins around with a sense of I, with fear, with worry. Planning is different. Planning is different. So there'll be planning and worry together. There'll be a package. Okay. And if you can separate out the narratives of self, what am I going to do? And you say, oh, worry feels this way. And just be patient. Then each time you do that, 
each time you do that, a uh, hundred times a day, however many times, you develop confidence in Dharma rather than belief and worry. It's hard work, it's hard work, but then, then you start to feel, okay, the, the liberation of the heart is not in our external security, but the liberation of the heart is in confidence in Dharma. If you think about the, 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 um, the first uh, discourse that the Buddha offers us in Theravada Buddhism, or has history has it, the Four Noble Truths, right? The Dhammachaka Sutta, most of you have seen that. And what is at the end of it? Anya Kandanya. Kandanya knows. And what does Kandanya know? He knows that that which arises ceases, that which begins end. But is his knowing just an, a, a kind of intellectual understanding? Did he just go to a Buddhist university and, you know, now he knows Buddhism 101, that that which begins end? No, we all know that. We all know that the seasons change, right? But Kandanya has seen, right? He knows. And this knowing is different than intellectual knowing. So when I, when I know, when fear rises and, and the knowing in me is, 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 is um, how should I say, it, it, it's filled with, dar- with uh, the understanding of anicca, then my relationship to the fear or anxiety or worry or resentment is one of confidence. Because I know this will change. And then I know it's my, not my real home. My real home is this very knowing, that very knowing. And sometimes we, we see that, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we remember, and sometimes we forget. So it is a matter of recollecting and remembering, rather than attaining. You don't attain the state of knowing that you know, do you? You just, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah. I feel this way. That's something you remember, you recollect. And that's what sati is really about. It's like recollecting and remembering the way things are. And so, so you have, you know, someone like Lompo Senedo saying it's like this and it all belongs. That's very profound because it's not, it's not intellectual. It's experiential. So when I feel, if someone feels anxiety and they say, anxiety feels like this, they're really feeling it in the body, in the emotions, they're seeing the thoughts and they're accepting it. They're open to it. This is what metta bhavna is. It's acceptance and openness. Huh? And as you do that, the refuge in silence becomes stronger and the belief in the self, the ego, all of that becomes less and less and less. You get more and more confidence. Now, that kind of confidence, you might, you might say that, that you know, when, when we talk about the um, Noble Eightfold Path, the first part of the path, Samaditi, is we say right view or right understanding. Now, when I first came across that, I thought right understanding was an intellectual position, a Buddhist position on on tanha or on anicca or on atta or dependent origination. So I studied all that and that was very very helpful. But there's another way of, of, of considering right understanding and that's experiential. Now, sitting here in this room, I feel this way. The air conditioner just turned, just clicked off. This feels comfortable, uh, there's nice lighting, and I know this is the way it is. I understand this is the way it is. And that's not intellectual, is it? It's not, I'm not analyzing, oh, it's a lovely room, or it's not a nice and lovely room. It's not a thought. It's not, a, not an opinion. Uh, it's not a dogma. Uh, it's not a position against other positions. It is as it is. And that's what we're trying to, one of the ways we think about right understanding, it's an exi- existential or experiential uh, understanding which we can always remember. It's like this, I understand. Even if I have doubt, you see, that's the beauty of it. And you can see why this takes you beyond the limits of thought, the limits of intellect. Intellect is good, right, good for problem solving. Thought is limited, but it can be very useful the thought is limited, and you know the knowing or that right understanding in a not, is not a thought in this way. And anyone, anyone uh, can, can remember that. You don't have to have a PhD or be a monk or be a nun or be a woman or be a man or be a young, old or whatever. It doesn't really, you don't need all that. You are what you are. And you can be neurotic. You can be not neurotic. 
We go through both, don't we? So you can feel very, very upset, and you can remember, oh, I know that I know. What do I know? Upsetness. And it's like this. That's where you want to get your confidence. This will change. Kundanya, that which has a nature to arise, has a nature to cease. This will change. And each time you put that language into it, you start to not only understand this moment, but you imbue it with right, uh, the right experiential attitude to it. You know that it will change. So the knowing becomes deeper, more profound, and your refuge in silence becomes more and more strong. It's beautiful that way. Now, in, in the world, you know, if you have doubts about, like if you, if you have a new uh, computer package, which you, uh, program which you need to learn about, then it's different. You have to learn. You have to study. You have to get better at your work. Or if you're doing woodwork, you know, you have to be, you have to have developed those worldly things. So without dismissing doubt and, and the capacity to problem solve, what I'm pointing to is the insidious nature of thinking doubt, the insidious nature of self that just keeps kind of haunting, haunting your mind. And, and, and what we're moving to is not, not something which is a, a conclusion intellectually. I know when I, when I started to see, like as a, as a young monk, I would see right understanding and right view, and I thought that if I just kept reading and reading and reading and reading and reading and then reading and reading, and you can read a lot in Theravada Buddhism, that somehow I would come to a set of conclusions where I'd never doubt. But I found, much to my, my uh, surprise, was the more I read, the more I doubted. <laughs> now, maybe I'm just not very intelligent. That could be. That could be a problem. But I'll accept that. But also I thought that, that I'm, I, how much information do I need I need some information, I need some teaching, but how, how can, what is it about information? Is it just about an encyclopedic collection of, of words? Am I just a Buddhist Wikipedia? Or do I need to learn how to use some basic tools of intellect to apply to the nature of my experience to liberate the heart? And that's what was crucial for me, liberation of the heart. And then I saw, actually, no, I need, to, I need to go deeply into a few ideas rather than have a broad, broad, broad encyclopedic understanding with more and more information. I found that very helpful for me. Now, scholars, I'm not a scholar, so scholars, they're wonderful because they do have encyclopedic minds, and they do present to us, it's like the whole, the whole body of text, they, they have it in their minds. I don't have that kind of a mind. But I do have a mind that likes to investigate, I do like the challenge of seeing suffering and the end of suffering. So for, for myself, like just taking something simple like, um, like a mood that might be coming up and just saying to myself, okay, can you, um, can you notice the arising of that mood? I can do that. Can you notice what kind of thoughts that creates? Yeah, I can do that. Can you notice the sense of self arising? I can do that. So I can investigate the mood. And then through that investigation, I see all that mood arises, depending on conditions, changes a bit, and then ceases. And all the time I'm doing that, I'm practicing awareness of dharma, rather than trying to fix my moods. In the past, as a, as a young monk, I always tried to fix my moods, and, which is good. <laughs> so I mean, I restrained myself and so on and so forth. But after a while, I said, I'm just trying to fix everything. I'm just trying to be the perfect little monk and, and, and be a lovely monk and never have any mood. But I had moods, and I realized, well, awareness isn't fixing. So I, I saw that, the, the, that what the Buddha was giving us was a transcendent solution rather than a psychological solution. There are psychological solutions that exist in Theravada Buddhism, sure, and they're very, very good, and people um, employ them and use them and reflect on them, but his to my, my sensitivity at least, his offering to us was not a psychological offering. He wasn't saying, get a better state of mind from the one you have. He said, discover the silence which is behind all states of mind. Right? Uh, realize Nibban, realize the deathless. And so, Anya Kandanya, Kandanya knows that that which has a nature to arise has a nature to cease. Lompacha, um, 
uh, it's uncertain. Uh, very interesting that you know you think well what, why does he keep telling me you could you could think if someone tells you it's uncertain wouldn't that make you more afraid you know logically it's uncertain my God it's uncertain what am I going to do uh, but at any say but that thought is uncertain too oh yes yes but it's so uncertain I could go into a panic <laughs> so why logically why would uncertainty lead to certainty huh? because if you apply it as a as a as a you know, perception to your experience right now this is uncertain it brings you to silence whereas craving brings you into the experience where you try to change the experience according to your desires you see same experience craving wants better worse wants to get rid of and that's why we so much emphasize the abandonment of the strategies of craving the strategies of craving are worldly strategies. So I'm hungry, I eat. I'm thirsty, I drink. I'm tired, I sleep. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bit restless, I go for a walk. Fine. Good. Nothing wrong with that. But to think that I can find the unconditioned in conditions is a fallacy. And the Buddha said the Nibbana, or the realization of Dhamma, is unconditioned. Right? So craving works in craving sphere. So craving works and I'm hungry, I eat food and so on. But the uh, observation of craving as an object is the great challenge of the spiritual life because craving takes you out into sense experience and uh, keeps fooling you into thinking that my liberation lies out there in sight, sounds, tastes, mental formations, emotions and so on. But it doesn't. It doesn't lie out there, it's always in here. And when we begin, and, and all of us see that to a certain extent. So let's say you have, uh, uh, okay, go come back to say feelings of anxiety and doubt. You start to feel anxiety and doubt. There's a craving not to feel that, right? But now you're witnessing that craving, so it's uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. It's not pleasant. But then that's what you say, oh, unpleasant feels this way. You know that you know this is unpleasant. And if you can bear with that, then the craving for security ceases, the need, in that way you still function, but you begin to see, yeah, the, the freedom of the heart is not an object out there, it's always something in here. So in times of uncertainty, which is always, <laughs> people say these are great times of uncertainty. Well, when hasn't it been uncertain, right? But now it's extraordinarily uncertain. We've never been through anything like this. So the volume of anxiety and fear might be very, very great. And that's because the conditions are such. But if you take refuge in knowing, knowing that you know, you, you can work through it. And through it, you, you, you start to really have a strong sense of confidence. So, Beats, I see I'm rattling on here. It's already almost 8 o'clock. Um, so perhaps I'll leave that for everyone's reflection there. Let's all say three sadhus together. Handamayam Oadadama Gadhayo Sadhu Karam Kadama Se Sadhu 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 Anumodam